So welcome everyone to our second last talk in our fall 2020 speaker series. My name is Victoria McPhail, I'm co-chair of Pollination Guelph, and very pleased to be able to bring this series to you. It's bringing mm -hmm. forward our cancelled talks from our cancelled March 2020 symposium forward to the fall in a venue that hopefully is more accessible to more people. Um, virtual versus in person is always a little bit different, um, but I think this has a lot of added value. So if you haven't already signed up for our last talk, uh, Shannon Sierra from Pollination Guelph, please go to our website and sign up now. As you may have already heard as well, um, we are recording these talks. And so if you have missed any of the talks in the series so far, or you're gonna miss on the, the last talk, please go to our YouTube channel. Generally within 24 hours, we do have the talks up and available. So tune in um, after the fact to watch the video. <coughs> I do want to say a big thank you to all our sponsors as well. As I mentioned, we had to cancel our March 2020 symposium, but they're all very gracious in allowing us to keep the funding and carry it forward to our fall symposium. And so if you have the opportunity to thank these sponsors yourselves through buying any of the products or just give them a shout out on social media, uh, please do so. We greatly appreciate their support. I do want to read our brief land acknowledgement. Um, it's important on this day and age to really address on the fact that many of us are settlers on this land, like including myself. And so Guelph is on the traditional territory of the Attawandaran and neutral people. We honor the original ancestors of this land and also offer respect to our Haudenosaunee, Ashinaabe, Mississauga, and Métis neighbors. We strive to be accountable by acknowledging this history and cultivating respect in our relationships with our Indigenous neighbors and the land. And as many of us are not in Guelph currently, please consider the region that you are currently living in and your relationship to the land there and the peoples, both now and historically. And I want to introduce our, introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Sue Chan has an academic background in environmental science, pollination biology, education, and agriculture. So extremely um, well-educated and lots of experience. She's the Ontario expert on the hoary squash bee, a specialist pollinator of pumpkin and squash, and has managed and implemented many on-farm and educational pollinator habitat projects. Presently, Susan is a lead researcher and manager of a project to implement honeybee vectoring our microbial biocontrol agents to strawberry crops in Ontario, which is super neat. Uh, Susan owns a 10 acre farm, which uses regenerative, um, so regenerative agricultural techniques to restore soil biology, grow cut flowers and create safe habitat for all insects and all wildlife. So we're gonna turn this over to Sue in just one second. I will remind you to please remain muted, muted and leave your video off. Um, if you have any questions, please add them to the chat box and we'll get to those at the very end with a better question and answer period. Uh, but keeping your video and uh, audio off keeps everything a bit smoother and um, this reduces distractions. And again, don't forget to sign up for the next talk in the speaker series because you don't wanna miss it. They're all pretty good. Um, so Sue, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. I'll just get my, sh my screen shared. <clears throat> okay, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, my name is Susan Chen, and I usually go by Sue. I'm a pollination biologist uh, in the lab of Nigel Rain at the School of Environmental Sciences at the University of Guelph. And um, I just really would like to thank Victoria and all the others who have organized the Pollination Guelph Speaker Series. Uh, it's really an impressive thing to have done under these circumstances. <clears throat> Today, I'd like to talk to you about an interesting relationship between a wild bee and a cultivated crop and the implications of that uh, association. The wild bee involved is the hoary squash bee and the crop, like the picture you see, is pumpkins or squash. <clears throat> my uh, screen is not, my computer is not allowing me to go to the next screen. There, there, worked. Okay. So the hoary squash bee is a solitary ground nesting bee. Uh, it's a strict pollen specialist on plants in the genus Cucurbita. Its origins are in Mexico and it co-evolved with a wild Cucurbita the buffalo gourd, and you can see the range of the wild cucurbita here in yellow on the map. <clears throat> However, over the last 10,000 years, um, the wild cucurbita have been domesticated and we've ended up with cultivated crops such as pumpkin and squash. And the hoary squash bee was able to switch from the wild cucurbita to the cultivated crops um, and thereby expand its range. The present range, <clears throat> 
of the hoary squash is in green here, and you can see that it, it, it is way larger than the range of its original um, uh, host crop, uh, host plant. Um, its present range also includes Ontario and Quebec at, the, at its northern limits. And um, it has become basically a really important pollinator of cucurbita crops. So here pictured, you see a picture of a flower, a cucurbita flower, this is a crop flower. And below you see a male hoary squash bee um, clinging to the central synandrium, which is the pollen bearing organ of the male flowers. Okay, so this is the system we're talking about. <coughs> Now, the hoary squash bee in Ontario was first recorded in 1908, so it's been around a while. In 1998 to 1999, uh, Dr. Peter Kevin did a presence absence study and noted here are all these little black triangles and little black circles. So these are all the places that he um, uh, surveyed to see if hoary squash bees were on plant cucurbita plantings here. And he found that in of 166 farms that he surveyed, about two thirds of them had hoary squash bees uh, on them. And most of the ones that didn't have hoary squash bees on them, those are the ones that are circles, uh, were in the northern parts of the province, of the, of the southern part of the province. In 2015 and 2018, I came along and decided to do an abundance survey. So what I was looking for is I was looking at what was the most abundant species or group of bees on cucurbita plantations um, across the province. And so my sites are marked in little green X's. And I also wanted to know if there was a um, temporal uh, convergence between flowering or the, or the crop uh, pollination uh, window and the activity of the bees. So here we see a graph. So along the bottom, I have the farm ID. So we had 19 farms that we were looking at. And along the y-axis, you see the frequency within the total bee population. So this is the frequency of each bee group. So we looked at four bee groups. The hoary squash bees are in dark blue, bumblebees are in teal, other wild bees are in red, and honeybees, those are managed honeybees, are in green. So obviously, um, certain things pop out of this graph. First of all, hoary squash bees were present on all the farm survey. And um, just give me a second. And the most abundant, the hoary squash bees were the most abundant bee type on 68% of farms. Okay, so this roughly um, aligns with what Peter Kevin found in 1998. Um, the more, the hoary squash bees are actually more abundant than all other bee types combined on 58% of farms. Okay, so this means that hoary squash bees are fundamentally the most abundant bees uh, on these kinds of plantations. They're active during the crop pollination window. And this is not true necessarily of honeybees or other wild bees. However, bumblebees are also active during the crop pollination window. So I concluded that the primary pollinator of pumpkin squash in Ontario is actually a solitary wild bee, which is fascinating. So association with a crop for a wild bee has lots of benefits. Uh, in fact, some of the benefits, uh, the, the habitat benefits provided by this crop are the reason why the bee is actually in Ontario in the first place. So I wanted to look at the benefits of the foraging habitat provided, mating habitat, resting habitat, and not included on my list because they're not actually provided by the crop is nesting habitat. Harm, however, is also um, associated with being involved with a crop because crops, um, because they're grown in a monoculture, have pesticides applied to them. And so the harm that would come from this association would be exposure to pesticides and then the effects of that exposure. <clears throat> um, in Ontario, there are uh, three systemic insecticides that are used on this crop. And this is really the focus of my interest is the effects of these systemic insecticides. So one of them um, is imidacloprid, and it was registered in 2006, so it's been around a while. Another one is thiamethoxam, and it was registered in 2014 as a seed coating. And the third one is chlorantranilaprol, which is not a neonicotinoid, and it was also registered in 2014. <clears throat> So before we talk about the, the bad side, let's talk about the good side. I'm a positive person and I like to think about all the benefits that this crop can provide. So the first one is foraging habitat. This crop provides a new crop of flowers every single day. These flowers are open from dawn until noon, which corresponds precisely to the activity period of this bee 
on a daily basis. The crop has male flowers and female flowers and many more male than female flowers. Both male and female flowers provide high quality uh, nectar, which has got, got a lot of sucrose, protein, and amino acids in it. And this, this, uh, this is in huge quantities, you know, 60 to 80 microliters is a lot of nectar. You can see nectar droplets in the flower on the, in the nectary of the flower on the left. On the right, you see a picture of a synandria with a full pollen load, and that uh, is equivalent to about 50,000 large uh, oily pollen grains per male flower. And interestingly enough, I did a quick calculation and I discovered that only about 1.2% of this pollen supply on the male flowers is needed for pollination. So all the rest is actually available uh, for consumption by insects. <clears throat> this is a great picture of a hoary squash bee female entering her nest and you can see her back legs are covered with pollen. So I captured these bees and counted the amount of pollen that they had on their bee, on their legs and it amounted to on average about 3000 pollen grains. She then, the female then takes the pollen grains back to her nests and she has, these are nest cells you see pictured here. And in the top nest cell, uh, the bee is stripping pollen off of herself or grooming it off of herself and dumping it in her cell. And she has to make 20 trips back and forth between the flowering patch and the nest cell to accumulate about 60,000 pollen grains. So in the lower cell, you, in the lower circle on the left, you can see uh, she is laying an egg on those pollen grains. And then she seals up that nest cell and the egg hatches into a larva which eats and co which consumes the pollen and nectar in that pollen, uh, in that, uh, in those provisions. <clears throat> so foraging on pumpkin and squash crops actually allows maximum reproduction in these species of bee. Uh, we know that solitary bees can mature about one egg per day. So that's our comparison. That's the maximum intrinsic amount that they can do. That's the maximum in intrinsic reproductive rate that they have. Uh, each foraging cycle on cucurbita crops lasts about 10 minutes and we need 20 trips. So 20 times 10 equals about three hours. This corresponds almost perfectly with pollen availability on the flowers, which is from six to 9 a.m. So we, so we know that association with cucurbita crops actually supports the intrinsic reproductive capacity of this species. <clears throat> So not only does this plant provide a foraging habitat, it also provides mating habitat, which is of course fundamental to reproduction. Um, and mating happens on open cucurbita flowers and the males seek many female mates. So they mate multiple times, but females mate only once and then they become unreceptive to males. And this is a quick video clip of an unreceptive female and what that looks like. <clears throat> so here you see two males and one female who is, wants nothing to do with them and she just flew off there. So resting is also an important um, part of health in insects and they need to rest to, to, for the same reasons that we do. And this particular crop provides great resting habitat um, and it's protected also. So the cucurbita flowers wilt by noon and this creates a protected chamber in the base of the flower. You can see with a little white circle here, the bees go into the flower before the flower completely wilts. And these would be male bees or unmated female bees. And they stay there and the flower closes around them and then they have protection through the afternoon and the night when they're not active. They'll emerge the next day. And this is a quick video clip of what that looks like. The flower that was blooming yesterday. So we're gonna open it up because the male squash bees sleep in these flowers. We're gonna see if there's a bee inside. Oh, look at, there's not just one bee, there are three male bees sleeping in the flower. They're just waking up to start their day's activities. Although the crop doesn't provide nesting habitat per se, the soil in which the crop is grown does provide nesting habitat. And so here you see the entrance to a hoary squash bee nest and the tumuli of all the soil that she's excavated from the main channel around the outside. And in the diagram on the right, you can see the bee creates a vertical channel and then creates lateral channels off of the vertical channel. And at the end of each lateral channel is that nest cell. So she creates about five nest cells per nest. And then she also has a little antechamber. So female bees don't rest in flowers, they rest in that antechamber. 
So crops are a source of harm by a pesticide exposure. Um, definitely, they provide all this great habitat, but they also provide this, this harm. And it, so we, we have to understand that growers must balance the need to control pests with the need to protect pollinators. And so it seemed like a good idea to use systemic insecticides on uh, to, to control pests in this crop because we removed the risk then of spraying these bees uh, while they were pollinating, while they were foraging on the crop. And so, as I said before, imidacloprid was brought on the scene in 20, 2006 and thymethoxam and chlorantraniloprol were brought on the scene in 2014. All three of these are systemic insecticides used to control the cucumber beetle on uh, pumpkin and squash crops. <clears throat> now, what does systemic insecticide exposure look like for ground nesting bees? Well, there are three major routes that I can think of um, that would cause uh, exposure because it doesn't matter if you apply a pesticide and the bee is never exposed, then there's no problem. It's the exposure, which is the first problem, right? So contact with residues in pollen is a problem. So this means that, that adult females and larvae, they both touch pollen. So this is not consuming, but this is touching. So adult females touch pollen as they harvest pollen and as they put it into the nest cells. Larva touch pollen because they actually lie on top of their pollen provisions and develop there. Okay, so this could be a real problem. Um, consumption of residues in pollen and nectar. This is uh, true for all adults, males and females and larvae because all of them eat pollen and nectar. And then the last source of, uh, the last exposure route is contact with residues in soil. And this is the one that I'm particularly concerned about because we haven't paid any attention to it. Um, adult females are particularly problematic here because they're the ones that are excavating the nests and building the nests, and this involves handling a lot of soil. Larvae may also come in contact with residues in soil. We don't know this for sure, um, and they may not actually, they may actually be protected from this because they develop in nest cells that are actually coated with a waterproof coating on the inside. So one way to look at um, hazard, and in this case, we're looking at mortality. So these are not sublethal effects. This is the effect, this is the likelihood of dying, okay, of mortality. And hazard quotients can, used, can be used to evaluate two things, the hazard to bees of exposure to a particular pesticide. So I can find out how likely is it that a pesticide is hazardous to bees, or I can use them to evaluate how likely a particular exposure route is to be hazardous to bees. And the equation involved is you, hazard quotient is just the residue concentration in the matrix. So that would be soil or pollen or nectar, the amount of exposure of soil, pollen or nectar, and then the lethal dose of the pesticide involved. And lethal doses depend on whether the exposure is via contact or whether it's oral. So things are usually more toxic when they're eaten than when they're contacted. <clears throat> so if we look at consumption of pollen by larva, uh, first of all, we, my, my results have shown that imidacloprid is the only systemic insecticide that's getting into uh, pollen. And I did the hazard quotient calculation and I came up with a hazard quotient of 0.06. So based on this, eating pumpkin and squash pollen is highly unlikely to kill a larva. Okay, this does not mean that it has no negative effect. What we're talking about here is mortality. I'll talk about the other things in a minute. If we have contact with pollen rather than eating it, <clears throat> then we have an adult, we're, we're talking about adult lethal exposure. So this is where the, the adult collects pollen and then brings it back to the nest. And here we have a hazard quotient of 0.03. So that is also very low. So we know that consuming or handling pollen is not directly killing quarry squash bees in either the adult or the larval stage. You can imagine how relieved I was uh, when I found this out, because uh, this is my favorite bee in the whole universe. <clears throat> However, contact with soil by adult females is a completely different ballgame. So the reason that soil is problematic is because insecticide residues, residue concentrations are greatest in soil. So if we looked at pollen, nectar, and, and soil, by far, we would find more residues and we would find greater concentrations of residues in soil. And the other problem is that females move a lot of soil. So they weigh roughly about 110 gram, uh, milligrams and they move 33.5 grams of soil to build one of their nests over their whole nesting period. <clears throat> 
So if we do the hazard calculation on that, it's 4.32, which is way above the acceptable hazard quotient of one. So when we're approaching a hazard quotient of one, that's sort of like a red flag. So here we're way over that. So because of this, I went on to look at uh, using probabilistic risk, te or risks, risk assessment techniques. I wanted to find out what is the likelihood of an adult female encountering a lethal dose in Ontario soils where cucurbit crops are grown. And the risk of exposure to lethal doses was high uh, for imidacloprid and clothianidin. The risk for clothianidin was 40% and the imidacloprid was 25%. So this is way above the acceptable risk level of 5%. So we have a very unpleasant uh, situation here in soils, in uh, agricultural soils where cucurbits are grown in Ontario. Then I wanted to know, well, what's the sublethal effect of a bee foraging on a crop under really normal uh, conditions? So I didn't want to expose bees directly. I wanted to expose them by, by having them forage on a crop. And so this is what I set up in this little hoop house. And I set up 12 of these hoop houses on a site uh, near my house in Peterborough. <clears throat> the effects of exposure to crops treated with systemic insecticides were quite uh, monumental for certain uh, systemic insecticides. So for imidacloprid as a soil treatment at planting, which is what it's registered for use on, uh, we have a greater than 84% reduction in pollen harvesting, in nest initiation, and in offspring production. That is a very, very serious reduction, and it's going to result in uh, declines of hoary squash bees on um, farms that use imidacloprid as their way to treat for, for um, striped cucumber beetle. If you use thiamethoxam as a seed coating, we found no significant detectable effect. This doesn't mean that there was no effect. It just means that within the confines of my, um, my study and within the power, the statistical power that I had in my study, I couldn't detect an effect. Okay? So it means that the effect is much smaller than it is for imidacloprid, if there is an effect at all. For chlorantranilipril sprayed on the leaves of young plants, this is also a systemic insecticide. We found no effect, but sorry, we found an effect on pollen harvesting, but no effect on nest initiation or offspring. Interestingly, we found no effect on pollination for any insecticide. So bees were still pollinating the crop, uh, regardless of what insecticide they were exposed to. So wrapping up, um, pumpkin and squash habitat supports maximum reproduction of hoary squash bees and provides mating, resting, and nesting sites. And this is the reason why these bees have managed to live in Ontario in the first place. Negative outcomes are management dependent. And this is, from my perspective, a cause for celebration because we can always manage our management. We can change our management and use and avoid using things that are really bad and use things that are less bad. Uh, in monocultural systems. Obviously, the best management system is one which doesn't include the use of pesticides. <clears throat> the greatest lethal risk for female hoary squash bees is neonicotinoids in soil. It is not in pollen or in nectar. Sorry, this keeps jumping on me. Um, soil applied imidacloprid in pumpkin and squash crops is very detrimental. Um, I, if I were asked my opinion about what I think about that application method, I would say it should be actually removed. Um, I, I, I think it's... Um, systemic insecticides appear to be much less harmful. However, I would uh, add a caveat that we actually need to do some more work on thiamethoxone. And then the last thing is that measuring crop pollination is not really a great way to evaluate pollinator health, health in this crop. So we have to actually directly evaluate pollinator health. Uh, health. With that, I just wanted to give a thanks to my crew that have helped me over the last five, four years, and especially Beatrice Chen uh, at the top beside the, uh, at, at the top, she was really, really instrumental in making all of this happen over the four years that it happened. So thank you very much, crew. Now I'm happy to take questions. <clears throat> Awesome. Thanks so much, Sue. Uh, so yeah, so people, if you have questions, please add them to the chat box down on the bottom of your screen, depending on where, what you have on your screen. Um, yes, yeah, Sue, amazing talk. It's always so interesting. We always think of the honeybees and the, sometimes the bumblebees, the squash bees and other native bees often get ignored um, for better or worse. Well, actually for worse, um, especially now looking at pesticides that, um, yeah, it's not just pollen and nectar we need to test it. We need to look at the soil.
Um, so if you have any questions, please add them to the chat box. I'm trying to bring up my um, screen to the question prompt. There we go. Um, <coughs> one second. Okay, I can answer that. Um, do squash bees go to other plants besides squashes and pumpkins? So the answer to that question is yes, we can. We can find um, pump, we can find pollen of other plants on hoary squash bees occasionally, but they do not use that pollen for um, provisioning their nests. And we think they're basically going to those other plants for nectar. <coughs> so they really are very strict pollen specialists. Okay, um, the pesticides I mentioned, are they not part of a, uh, sorry, can, can we go back to that question about uh, the pesticides I mentioned? Yeah. <clears throat> so the pesticides I mentioned, are they not part of a uh, neonicotinoid ban in Ontario? Well, as far as I know, there is actually no neonicotinoid ban in Ontario. Um, what, what happened in Ontario is that there was a restriction on neo, certain neonicotinoid use on certain crops, um, those being the big field crops, but there was never such a ban for any other crop in Ontario. Um, and I don't even know the status of that, uh, of the implementing of that ban because we had a government, a change in government and with changes in government come changes in regulations or in enacting regulations, I would say. So um, if we really want change, it has to come from uh, the federal level where things are registered and labeled <clears throat> do the larvae eat the pollen in the nest as they develop? Yes, absolutely. That's what it's there for. So the, the bee puts all the pollen and nectar into that nest, and then the larva hatches and basically eats its way through um, the pollen and nectar supply there. It's sort of like having a baby, putting it in a room, filling it up with 18 years of food and shutting the door, and the baby has to fend for itself. That's kind of what it's like. <clears throat> Um, do I think systemic pesticides may be affecting long-term development? Well, I have no data. And so this is why I'm very eager for us to understand the difference between lethality and um, uh, sublethal effects. So all that HQ stuff that I showed you, that's all lethality. What's the likelihood of dying outright, right? But for long-term development issues, that's another, that's a whole nother kettle of fish, which I don't have an answer for. <clears throat> first of all, we have to know first, we have to know first of all, whether they're being exposed in the first place, right? We, we actually don't know if the larvae are being exposed. We know that they're in the soil. We know that the, the exposure potential is there, but we don't know whether that little layer of waterproofing in the cell protects them. I may have missed some other questions. <clears throat> um, okay. Do I want to, um, are, let me see, do most nest in the crop field or do some nest in safer areas? Okay, so this is the thing that is going to save us here with respect to soil. Hoary squash bee aggregations often form on lawns or in protected areas on farms where there's no um, neonicotinoid or any systemic uh, or any pesticide applied. And so you can, we can end up with great big, huge aggregations of these bees in these protected areas. And so my advice to farmers is always find nesting aggregations and protect them. And then you don't need to worry so much about what's happening within the cropping area. Because my guess is what's happening within the cropping area is bees are dying as they build their nests, but the bees that are building their nests outside of cropping areas are surviving. <coughs> Um, are zucchini also pollinated by and important to the hoary squash bee? Yes, zucchini are the same, are they're in, in the cucurbita and they're exactly the same species as pumpkin. They're just a different variety. So yes, they're also pollinated and important to hoary squash bees. And, and interestingly, I haven't, I've been talking about agricultural systems because that's where the pesticide exposure occurs, but hoary squash bees can be supported by gardens in cities or in the country also. <coughs> Have I missed anybody? Um... I didn't see any other questions. Jim Chapa did clarify that the neonic, not quite banned. There's regulation in place for kind of field crops, like just the soybeans and, um, sorry, I think it was canola, not canola, but um, one of the grains. 
yeah. not actually applying to things like squash plants mm -hmm. or our horticultural industry or other locations. And it's not a complete ban. It's kind of based on yeah. need, at least in theory it's based on need. So it's still being used in Ontario and the restrictions, yeah. the reduction has not happened that we'd hoped to have happened. So still lots of work to do there. However, I, I would say that, you know, the Liberal government did something really good. And, you know, because I, I, I talked to them about this issue and I said, you know, your use of neonicotinoids and your need for neonicotinoids are not lining up. So the first thing that needs to happen is we need to line up use and need, right? Uh, we can't be using this stuff where we don't need it because there isn't any pest um, on, on field crops. Um, and as you said, uh, there has been no there have been no restrictions on um, other crops. Although Jim, if he's still here, I'm not sure if he is. Um, I'm not sure if soil applied imidacloprid is now, uh, has now been removed from, uh, from labels. In other words, you can't apply it, neonic, you can't apply imidacloprid to soil anymore. I'm not sure if that has actually happened or not. <laughs> um, are there any organic controls for cucurbit pests or IPM? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> so the answer to that is, I don't think so. Um, I'm very interested in this subject, which is why I've moved a little bit from pollination into a new area, which is um, organic pest control on strawberries. But I'm very interested in organic pest control on pumpkin and squash. But as of the moment, we don't have anything. How are the insecticides different or the same as the neonicotinoids or are they the same family? Okay, so we have two families or two uh, types of, of systemic pesticides that I looked into. One is an anthranilic diamide and it affects uh, muscles. So it causes problems in muscles and it causes, uh, but it's not as long lasting as neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids attack the nervous system and cause death by cut by um, overcharging the, the nervous system. It's like the, neuro, the neurons are constantly charging, and so the bee dies because of that. <clears throat> um, I don't know if that's a good enough answer. So these, these anthranilic diamides and neonicotinoids are two different classes, but they're both systemic. And what systemic means is that you apply it to one part of the plant, and it moves throughout the whole plant. And so systemic insecticides are generally very water soluble because that's how things move in plants through water. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay, so if any, if um, I'm just going to give you my email address in case you have a question that you'd like to ask me in the future. Can I do that? Uh, yeah, you can either share it in the chat box or put it up uh, on your slide. Okay, I'll just give me a second and I'll, um, to everyone, and my email address is dchan05 at u Well, I'd be happy to talk to you, um, to anybody about any aspect of this or anything else about squash bees. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Sue. Again, fantastic talk. You're always an amazing speaker, and this was not uh, any exceptions. Uh, again, totally new, interesting area for people. Many people haven't considered agricultural crops and how bees that nest in the soil are affected. We think of bees going to flowers, but not nesting in the soil. So lots to think about and lots to keep talking about. Um, so reminder to people to tune in one more time this Thursday evening at uh, 7 o'clock, I believe it's 7.30. I should know that time, but tune in Thursday evening for our last talk um, and tune into our YouTube channel for the past talks and thank you to our sponsors. So thanks to Sue, thanks for sponsors, thanks to you guys and um, that's it for us today. <laughs>